All right. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Hero Makers podcast. And we are now in February, middle of February. And what, what is life like in Toronto in the middle of February right now? Is it quiet? Well, it's the same because we're under lockdown. <laughs> are you still on very strict lockdown? What's going on up there? Yeah, pretty strict. Um, with no end in sight. They said another two weeks. So um, very quiet. <laughs> okay, very quiet when you walk on the street. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, I mean, you know, Anne, that I've started to uh, train for a marathon. And I told you, I told you guys, our listeners, that I was going to do this. And, uh, and the past four weekends, I'm not kidding, Anne, the past four weekends that I've tried to go outside and do a long run, it's either been like, you know, five to eight inches of snow or it's been freezing cold. And so this past weekend, it was like negative 10. It was really cold. So I was forced, I was forced to go to the gym for the first time in a year. So everybody has to wear masks, right? And so I'm in the corner on the treadmill with my mask running five miles and it was awful. <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's not very comfortable, but whatever. But I'm like, maybe this was my mistake of starting my marathon training in the dead of winter. Yeah, maybe. Pandemic. <laughs> so, you, though. anyways we're, we're 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 okay but um and, and uh we are very excited about our guest today chris fields who's coming to us from oklahoma city who we're gonna introduce here in a second but uh chris let me first tell you that um maybe a month ago we had somebody on named jim mcdonough colonel jim mcdonough and he had been a veteran he was a veteran of 26 years he was in the military and now he has this organization called Headstrong. Mm -hmm. And um, if you guys didn't listen to that episode, go back. I think it was episode 27 or something. But, um, but Jim works with veterans who, have, you know, who are dealing with trauma. And they provide free mental health services to um, them and their families. So I, I feel very excited, Chris, because yeah. I feel like we're kind of continuing that conversation in a mm -hmm. different way. Um, and so, so welcome to the podcast, Chris. How are you today? How's Oklahoma City? Well, I'm good. And, and first of all, you know, thank you for, for having me on. It's always an honor to, to come on to these type of shows and, and share my story. And uh, in Oklahoma City, it's brutally cold right now. It's, uh, <laughs> it's been below freezing for three or four days and there's, it's, we won't be above freezing again until like the 20th. So another yeah. week and a couple of days and little ice, little snow. <laughs> and a little sunshine a little yeah. so it's just typical yeah. Oklahoma in year round basically you never know right until and we I, get to the until we get to the brutal summers and so. that's <laughs> it's like one thing after another right and you were telling us before that you guys have to deal with tornadoes too so there's just a lot going on but um so so Chris you have 31 years of experience in Oklahoma City as Oklahoma City firefighter and you retired mm -hmm. um what three or four years ago in 2017 uh, March March 1st will be four years great yeah yes. congratulations um, that is a 31 you. years is a long time to say yeah it was almost it was almost 32 it was 31 years and seven months so yeah I yeah. just I just couldn't pull off those other five months so oh, man. <laughs> yeah well I'm very excited to talk to you because you are the first firefighter that we've had on the podcast yeah. and typically <laughs> Like when we think of heroes and hero makers, we think of um, firefighters, police, medical workers, this guy. Mm -hmm. So I'm very excited to hear about your story. And we're going to talk a little bit about like, trauma and mm -hmm. some of the hidden trauma that goes with um, being a firefighter and serving the public and kind of that sacrifice that, that you make. And so I think right. it'll be really helpful to our listeners. So why don't you start by telling us a little bit about growing up and did you know you always wanted to be a firefighter? Are you from Oklahoma City? Like, tell us a little bit about, about you. Okay. Um, born and raised in Oklahoma. Um, I think when I was young enough, I don't even remember. I think we moved out to California for like six months and then we were back here. So that's what I was told. So anyway, um, I grew up in a, a, a little a small town called Dell City. It's just uh, east of Oklahoma City, just 10 or 15 miles. I was there until I was a sophomore in high school, and then we moved to Moore, Oklahoma, which is, that's pretty famous for being Tornado Alley, but uh, we moved there when I was a sophomore, so, you know, I went from, uh, I went from a school to where, and, and Dell City is a, I mean, it's a pretty good little city, but like, my graduating class, if I'd have stayed there, would have been like probably 400 people. Mm -hmm. I moved to Moore, my graduating class was 1,100 mm -hmm. people, 
you know, so I went from this little, it's a city, but it's a little smaller community to this big, huge, you know, 1100. We had, our high school was just juniors and seniors and there was 2,400 enrollment, you know, so uh-huh. yeah. crazy, but it's, yeah. they've built two more high schools since then and everything. So, um, you know, growing up, I don't think I was typically one of those kids that said, you know, I want to be, you know, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a, you know, a cowboy. I want to be a firefighter. I just, um, I, I grew up at a church where my, my best friend was the preacher's kid. And uh, his dad was the chaplain of the Oklahoma City Fire Department at the time. And so I got early exposure to being around that time. We'd go, I would go with him on the weekends if I stayed the night to visit the fire stations and eat dinner with them, play volleyball, you know, uh, and go with the, with the preacher, you know, if they made some, ha- some fires and stuff. So it, it always appealed to me. I thought even at a young age, I was impressed with the, uh, the, the camaraderie, you know, and because, you know, I grew up playing sports. So seeing the teamwork and I used the word brotherhood back then, now it's a brotherhood and a sisterhood, but when, and back then it was just, there were no women on the job, you know? So I, I, like that brotherhood they had and the pride they took in there. I mean, this, I'm pretty young, I'm 10, 11 years old and this stuff's standing out to me, you know, the, the pride they took in the job they did and, and the respect and the way they were treated by the community. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that they're, when they come to work, that their, their goal is to take a bad situation and make it better. That's what we, you know, that's what we tried to do. So it always appealed to me. And, um, but I went on, you know, went through high school and, and started into college and was working for my dad in the oil field a little bit and stuff. And I thought, you know, something's just, I really didn't know what I wanted to do in college. I was just going because everybody else was, you know, going. And um, I just thought something just didn't clicking. So I thought, I'm going to go apply for the fire department. And in 1985, I was, I was fortunate enough to uh, be, there was a 25, they were starting a 25 uh, person rookie class. And I was fortunate to be one of those 25 out of like 3,200 applicants. Yeah. So it was just, uh, and, and the, before that, I had applied at a little uh, small, very small department and didn't get hired. And I <laughs> thought, nah, I'm done. What, what, is, sudden, what is the application process like for, for that? It's a lot different now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It's um, now, I mean, you've got to, you been, when I, when I applied, you went and you took this little, uh, written test that was kind of like the test you take in school, you know, read the paragraph and answer the questions above, you know, they just want to see your, I guess, your cognitive ability to see if you can even, you know, accomplish that. And so, uh, and then you just go through a, a physical test and then of course an interview with, you know, uh, and when I went through the interviews, we always talk about these, these younger guys have got it made because our interviews were with these old chiseled stone chiefs and you're in a <laughs> conference room that's, no bigger than the average bedroom and there's smoke, you know, and it's just smoke filled and they're staring, you know, it's just, it was a, that was, that's, that was probably one of the scariest parts of the job was sitting through that interview. <laughs> Wait, and, they uh, smoked? That'd be really huh? cool. Oh <laughs> yeah. Back then it, yeah, they smoked it back in 1985. Yeah. They were, you could smoke in the fire stations. You could smoke. I mean, you can't anymore, of course, but, uh, but now it's a little more rigorous uh, testing. It's um the, uh, the physical ability part, what they call a CPAT is, uh, it's a, it's a, you better be in shape. It involves wearing, um, like an 80, 60 pound vest, you know, a weighted vest to simulate, you know, all your bunker gear and everything. And you, you drag hoses and you swing axes and it's a, it's a, uh, it's a pretty tough little process now. And there's so many applicants. Hmm. Okay. So right. this is 1985, right? And you were <laughs> how old at this time? Early twenties? Mm-hmm. Very, very early 20s I got hired okay. when I got hired on July 12th of 1985 I was two weeks from being 21 okay I turned so I got hired when I was 20 two weeks from being 21 okay and, uh, so. so okay so then so tell us about those early years of being a firefighter like what was surprising to you what what did were there any stereotypes that you're like oh yeah this is like I've heard this and this is really true and um yeah, you know, I, I had an uncle that was on the job, and <clears throat> I was I was warned about some of the the uh, what we call new boys, rookie, pro B, whatever they wanted to call it. Well, a lot worse names than that. Whatever they wanted to call us uh, about the hazing and yeah. some of the stuff that that went on. It was uh, I, you always you always heard about it, but then when you <laughs> some of the stuff you experienced, you're going, wow, this is real. 
you yeah. know, and, uh, but I can still say one of the things that stood out, the, still stands out the most, and, and most firefighters like this, and firefighting profession is like any other profession. There's bad apples, and there's good apples, mm -hmm. but, you know, I'm going to say 98% good apples that, that I've always experienced in the fire service, but even those bad apples that you just, I say, I wouldn't associate with this guy on my day off. He's a jerk. He's, you know, he doesn't know when to draw the line. He doesn't, but when the, when the bell goes off and the tone goes off, all that is out the window. Mm -hmm. I mean, because you're dependent. I mean, if, especially if it's a house fire, you're, you're dependent on these people and they're dependent on you, you know? So that was one of the things that almost always impressed me, you know, and even as I went through my career and became a station officer and stuff, you get, you get some people you just don't mesh with. I mean, that's just, that's just life. You try and I think, well, it's a job, but like I say, when the lights come on, the tone goes off and it doesn't matter if you're on a, you know, a first aid call, car wreck or house fire, all that, all that goes out the window and it's your, mm -hmm. it's about everybody else. You're putting all your personal. And that's another thing I always enjoyed about the fire service. Uh, the people you worked with, uh, and when the bell goes off and you're getting a call, we don't worry about uh, race, religion, you know, social economic background, what's your political affiliate, all that stuff's out. It doesn't matter to us, yeah. you know. And it's the same way when you're working with people. I've worked with, <clears throat> I've worked with, <clears throat> excuse me, I worked with guys and girls from different political beliefs, religious beliefs, sexual orientation. It doesn't matter. And mm -hmm. that's just one of the things about the fire service that's always impressed me. Mm. Well, you know, I can imagine that there's some, there is something really powerful about having a common mission, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're out there to, to protect and to serve and, and that that really does have this unifying factor that I think maybe the everyday person doesn't have with a lot of other people, right? Um, totally agree. Yeah. <clears throat> So, yeah. And I'm wondering, Chris, like, okay, so 31 years is a, a long time um, to, to be in the same, in the same place. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of, there's faithfulness that speaks to me of faithfulness, but uh -huh. what, what, ha what did you notice like over those 31 years of things that maybe have maybe changed uh, or <clears throat> things that even stayed the same? Like, is it the same kind of person kind of still would come in? I, I think it, I think it takes the same kind of person. Uh, I mean, you, you have to have a, a, a heart for the job or you'll burn out. You won't, you won't make it, you know, I, I, I think, but, you know, and I think, um, of course, you know, things have changed a little bit because of, you know, times have changed. You have to, it's like every other thing you have to, you have to evolve with the times, you know, or you, you fall behind. And, um, one of the things that impressed me with the fire service throughout my career is and there's a lot of fire departments that don't even go by the word fire department now they go by emergency services mm -hmm. because you know when i got on in 85 we had very few paramedics on the job we weren't even emts most of us were just what we call basic first responders mm -hmm. so we'd make calls just to help the ambulance mm -hmm. and then we did car wrecks and house fires well now you know by the time i left the job i was trained in you know swift water rescue high angle rescue you know uh we've got Oklahoma City has 37 fire stations and almost every one of the engines now is what we call a ALS, advanced life support. They all have paramedics on them. Mm -hmm. Everybody on the job now is at least a EMT, you know? So, I mean, things like that have, uh, and it was just ever changing throughout, uh, throughout my career. Mm -hmm. But like I say, it's just, it's just, I don't think people understand what all the fire department or what emergency services, you know, they do offer. Yeah. Wow. It sounds way more complicated now, but hopefully in a really good way. It, it is. And, and the training, and there's so many different avenues now that people can take on the job. As far as once you're on the job, you've been on a few years and you can go into, uh, and you keep your fire department rank, but you can go into pub ed, public education, where you're out going to the elementary schools and daycares, talking to kids about fire safety. You can go into code enforcement where you're, you know, everything that's being built new in the city, you're responsible to make sure all, you know, building codes that affect the mm -hmm. fire service are met, um, arson investigation. There's just so many different avenues that you can go down, like say, and get swift water training, high angle, all these different, be, you can be a, a diver, an underwater, you know, scuba diver. Mm -hmm. And, and there's skills you can take with you to go do something, you know, either on your day off or after you retire even. So, yeah. so I'm curious, like, 
of all the complexities and all the different ways, which is really, really cool to hear. You said the, the person hasn't changed. I'm curious about like what kind of person, like can you describe that person? What, what kind of person is attracted to this career? I think it's a, it's a, it sounds simple, but it's kind of, you know, that person that, that wants to give back, you know, to their, to their community, you know, and there are some people who say, you know, and it is, it's a great job. It's got good pay. It's got great benefits. It's got a great retirement, but there has to be more than that. Or, you know, and, and I tell people until March 1st of 2017, the day I retired there, I can't think of a day that I didn't, wasn't ready to get up and go to work. And it takes that type of person. And it takes a type of person that, uh, and this is where things get difficult for firefighters. I think some people forget we're human. So you have to go, you have to leave things that are going on at home, whether they're good or bad, you know, you have to kind of just block them out when you're there for 24 hours at the fire station. Uh, you're having an argument with your wife. You can't be worrying about that when you're responding on a house. You know, so there's just, and the job, you cannot be a selfish person on the, and be a member of the fire service or law enforcement or a doctor. And I got a daughter who's a, a, a daughter-in-law who's a nurse and you just have to be willing to put everybody else's needs above your own. It doesn't matter what kind of day you're having, good or good or bad. So, okay. So Chris, talk to us about that day when you're like, I can't, I'm, I'm done with this. Like I need to kind of move on. What, what led up to that? Like give us a little bit of a, a an inside look into just maybe the difficulties too of, of being a firefighter. I, th I think what, when I finally said, I'm going to give it up was I think when, um, when I start, felt like I started to lose that, that feeling of, you know, the red lights and sirens running down the road at three o'clock in the morning that, that used to, man, your adrenaline would just be pumping and you just loved it. Well, I could, I could tell slowly, which I was getting this point where I was going, Oh my gosh, we got to get up again, <laughs> you know, and mm -hmm. I'd never had that feeling. I mean, every time the lights kicked on, you're ready to go. And, Which is uh, amazing because I've had that feeling after like two years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it was just, you know, it's just one of those, uh, there wasn't anything on the job, bless you. There wasn't any, <laughs> there wasn't anything on the job in particular, you know, that said, nah, I'm done with this because yeah. um, I was really never just done with it. I just knew it was time. And I seen, I saw a lot of uh, guys on the job, some of my mentors and stuff that stayed too long. If that makes mm -hmm. sense, mm -hmm. you know, where they were, they'd gripe about having to come to work. Everything, you know, every time the lights kicked on, they were going, oh, here we go. Another, you know, frequent flyer, first aid call, you know? Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to wait until I was at that point. I wanted to, I wanted to go ahead and go wide. And it, it, it you know, Financially, it worked out to where I could retire at that time. Mm -hmm. So it was just a point where I said, I want to go while I still have a love for the job. I didn't want to leave being bitter about yeah. the job, which, and I've seen a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people do. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people do that because that becomes their identity. Mm -hmm. And that, that is a struggle, even for me. I mean, it's a struggle when, you know, people, what do you do for a living? I'm a firefighter. And you see, see somebody and go, what do you do for a living? Um, I'm a retired firefighter. I mean, you know, it's just not. So I think, I think a lot of people stay because that is their identity and they don't know what they're going to do when they, I didn't have any plans. I just knew I needed to go, yeah. you know, I yeah. just felt like I was, I was ready, but I was able to, do I miss the job? I don't, I do not miss getting up and down all night on medical calls. And now I'd probably go fight another house fire for free if they would let me, you know, yeah. that's kind of a, it's a fun deal. Mm -hmm. But most of all, I miss the camaraderie. I miss the, uh, the, the brotherhood and the sisterhood and the, the joking at the station and, the, and that little family atmosphere you have. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, well, I, I was going to say, I, you know, I, I imagine there would be that identity, there would be the community and then there would also be probably the security of it. Right. Um, giving that up is probably um, a little bit challenging too, but, but Chris, yeah. I, I want to hop um, to a little bit to what you do now, which is mm -hmm. you, you share part of your story um, of, kind of dealing with just some of the hidden kind of some, some of the hidden pains mm -hmm. and of, of trauma and PTSD and that, but, um, but on your website, which is chrisfields.org, and we're going to link to mm -hmm. that in the show notes for you guys. But, um, but, but on your website, you, you, you say out of chaos comes order and the opportunity to grow, which 
I really like that. Um, and I found that to be the case in my life as well. Mm -hmm. When I, I went through a lot of, you know, some very turbulent times a number of years and, um, and just the, some of the fruit that comes from pain that, you know, we grow through that and talk to us about, yeah, kind of your story and then what led you to want to be an encouragement to people who have experienced trauma in different ways. Okay. Uh, so you want me to go back to the, to the, the bombing and talk about where. Yeah. And yeah. And so, yeah. So, you know, okay. you were part of the rescue efforts in the Oklahoma city bombing in yes. 1995, which I think most of us who are old enough to remember, it was <laughs> horrific. You know, I mean, even watching it on TV. And so you were, you had, you had gotten some publicity for a, a picture where you were carrying this little girl. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and so, yeah, so to talk to us like about, you know, if that moment was part of it and just kind of what, yeah, I mean, your story. Okay. I'll, um, yeah, I'll wrap it up in a nice little packet. Try not to just try not to ramble on too long, but um yeah, and you know, without going in through all when we got the call for the bombing and all that, but you know, when, uh, when her name was Bailey Allman, the the photo was taken me holding Bailey, and, and um, how that came about was we had um, got down to the scene and we were go, had an assignment to go to the backside of the building and start helping try to remove rubble and get people out. So um, a gentleman uh, who I've met since now, his name is John Avery. He was an Oklahoma City police officer. He was just dressed in civilian clothes. He came around the car. I realized I don't know where he came from. He just like, boom, he was in front of me. And he said, I have a critical infant. In 1995, Oklahoma the police department wasn't really as first aid trained maybe as they are now. They knew firefighters were, you know, EMT anyway. So he was just looking for somebody. And in talking to Sergeant Avery uh, years later, he said I was the third person that he came in contact with saying I have a critical infant and it wasn't that people weren't trying to help him they were just saying you know either there's an ambulance over there or there's some firemen or you know whatever so he finally got to me and and I really don't know why instead I didn't just say you know we're going here take her over there I just said here I'll take her and he handed me Bailey and um you know the first thing I did was search her uh check her for any uh signs of life which I didn't I didn't find any and she had like an open skull fracture and she had a bunch of uh, what I thought at the time was insulation. I, but then, you know, thinking about it, it was concrete dust that was in her throat. So I cleared her airway. Anyway, took her across the street, not even a block to where there was an ambulance and uh, told the paramedic on the ambulance, I have a critical infant. His ambulance was full and there was people laying around him on the ground on, on backboards. And he told me, he said, well, wait just a minute. We're not going to put that baby on the ground. That's when he was getting a blanket out of the ambulance. And, you know, I didn't, didn't find out about the photo until like 1130 that night. Didn't see it for the first time until the next morning. But when I saw the photo of me holding Bailey and looking down at her, I knew exactly where I was at, what point I was at, what I was thinking. That is when the paramedic was getting the blanket. So I would just stand there waiting for him. And I was just looking down at her and right then thinking, this was early, like 45 minutes into the incident, maybe, or even earlier. And I was thinking, holding her thinking, you know, of course, my, I had a son at home that was two years old at the time. So I knew she was relatively close in age. And Bailey had just turned one day old. I mean, one year old the day before. April 18th was her one year birthday. And um, I just thought, you know, somebody's world is going to be turned upside down, you know, today. And, and then not realizing that that thought from any other first responder on the scene was going to be replayed 167 more times, you know, around the building that day. So it was 168 fatalities, um, 19 of them uh, children. There was like seven or 800 even injuries. And, you know, some of the people that I know that were in the building that survived that I've met, since, some of them are still having corrective surgeries, you know, 25 years later for things. So that was the effect of it. Um, but to get to the to the effect of the, of the bombing and the photo was, um, you know, and a lot of people, I think it was once it came out, the being singled out was really hard, uh, you know, and, and the word, we all hate the word hero. I mean, we know it comes with the territory, but, you know, um, I would do interviews and people, 
Uh, like we talked, you know, before the show, there were some people that thought Bailey survived and thought Bailey was alive. And so I would be asked about, you know, uh, mm-hmm. so, you know, being a hero and saving Bailey, I had to say, well, you know, that, so that word associated with, cause I'm in my mind, I'm going, there's nothing heroic about what I did. You know, I, um, and I'll get to a point to where Aaron Bailey's mom kind of turned that around for me. But, uh, so that, and I, and I, the, when I first saw the photo the next morning, I thought, oh my gosh, does they're putting this thing all over. I mean, it was everywhere, all over the world on all these different newspapers. And, and, uh, my first concern was about, does the family even know? I mean, nobody knew her name at that time. Nobody knew, but, uh, I thought a mother, a mother's in, a mother's going to know that's their child, just that mother's instinct, you know, mm-hmm. by, and, and Aaron did, she recognized her when she uh, saw the photo, but uh, she had already found out Bailey was deceased and had already identified her body, but she didn't know about the photo until the next morning, her grandparents saw it and she saw it and she said, that's Bailey. She just knew that was Bailey in the photo by her little yellow sock she had on and everything. And so, um, as the, when I met Aaron, you know, and I thought, you know, I didn't do anything heroic and me and Sergeant Avery, uh, Aaron wanted to meet us. We were both like, why does she want to meet us? What she had to say to us. And the first thing she did was she thanked us for, she said, I could tell y'all were both fathers by the way y'all carried and handled Bailey. She said, so that made me feel good that she was comforted. She said, I'm thankful that I know Bailey's fate because there's so many other people that are, this was just a, this was the day after when we met her. So or two days after, but you know, and it was weeks and weeks before everybody was identified and people found out about their, you know, their loved ones. And so she was just thankful that, you know, Bailey was out. She knew Bailey's faith and she could, you know, begin the process. And, and she just kept thanking us for, uh, you know, she's like I said, she could tell we were fathers by the way we cared for her. And that was interesting about meeting her was here was a 20 year old single mom who had just lost her one year old child. And she's comforting these, you know, supposed to be big old strong, stout first responders. And we're, we're a soup sandwich, man. We're just, we're, we're done. And she's, you know, she's got her arm around, she's comforting us. So, which speaks volumes for, for Aaron and, you know, and her strength. So, but um, as, as things went on, um, you know, I, I kind of felt like I need to be there for Aaron. I, I took on this irrational guilt of, well, because of the photo, I need to be there for Aaron, kind of like a big brother. So I took on this irrational guilt of that. Um, I was the last one to hold her child, you know. Uh, She couldn't even hold her or touch her, really. I think that came into all this. She's part of evidence and all this stuff I don't understand. And uh, so she couldn't even, I was the last one that she knows to hold her child. And so that stuff, you know, it was taking its toll on me, but I just kept, you know, kind of pushing it away, pushing it down so I could... uh, go on and do my job you know I didn't want at that time 1995 PTSD really wasn't a uh, wasn't as commonplace it is now it was and, and it sounds horrible to say this but in 1995 you'd hear PTSD when they do stories about homeless Vietnam vets I mean that's just the way it was that's that's what PTSD was related to and so and and to backtrack I was brought up on the job by these old grizzly firefighters, you know, ones that didn't even wear a mask into house fires. And, and it's not that they didn't care, that they didn't have sympathy and empathy for people, but that's the way they were taught when they came on the job. You just got to suck it up and push on, you know, that's just the way it was. And um, so that's what I did. And um, did that for, you know, several years, just kind of thought I was doing a pretty good job of, you know, keeping it hid from people. Um, and it wasn't for, you know, several years that, you know, I wasn't getting as good at it. It was starting to really weigh on me mentally. And, uh, so and my, my wife started noticing, you know, me being a little more, um, distant and, and, and I even, I, I knew it, but I didn't want to admit it, but I'd have these little, you know, little doubts of depression and, you know, anger and getting angry over the silliest stuff. And, um, you know, it started to drive a wedge in me and my wife at the house. And um, so this went on for, for a while. And um, just to skip all the gory details of, of 
what kind of horrible person I was, it came to a point to where, you know, my wife pretty much said, you either go get help or you get out. Mm-hmm. And, well, nobody's going to tell Chris Fields what to do. You know, I'm a big, tough firefighter. I can handle it. So I'll see you. So um, we were we were separated for 16 months. And, you know, in that time there was, you know, I started to drink more than I usually do. Uh, there was, you know, extramarital affair. There was just so much stuff that I was just, you know, uh, uh, humiliating my wife, my family, friends, pushing people away that were trying to help me. And this was all away from the job. And when I would go to work, there was a lot of people that never knew anything was even going on mm-hmm. in my other life. <laughs> I mean, they didn't know that all this was going on when I would, you know, that me and my wife were even separated and all this. And so it came to a point to where, um, like I say we separated for 16 months and we're talking, you know, we're, we're six or seven years on down the uh, line on the job later. And, um, I had a doctor friend who'd get me, you know, some, uh, Xanax and stuff to help with anxiety and all this. And I got to where I needed that to even go to sleep at night. You know, I'd have to have a couple of those with a drink and that way I could sleep. That way I get up, be at work the next day and act like nothing's wrong, which I was pretty good at for a long time. And, um, things just kept evolving. And then, you know, finally the, the, the bombing and all that kind of stuff really wasn't even now I'm looking reality and faced with the fact of the, the things I've done to my family and humiliated my family and uh my friends ones I pushed away and not being the you know not even by this time I've got you know another son I've got two kids sons now and uh, you know by this time it's uh like I said it's, things have just spiraled out of control I'm not being the father the husband the friend I should be to anybody really mm-hmm. and um I did you know and that's when you know suicidal ideation started creeping in and all sorts of stuff and it came to a point to where I had made enough um, calls of accident, what they call, you know, accidental overdoses, you know, with people. So I thought, well, I'm going to see if I can just take enough Xanax, drink enough that either I'm going to sleep really well or I'm not going to wake up. And I was to the point to where I thought, well, if I don't, then everybody can reset and start all over, you know. And but I was so worried about what people thought about me, too. I thought, well, this way it looked like it's an accident, too, that. Chris Field, it was just an accident. Not that he couldn't handle it. It was just an accident. I mean, those are, that's, you got to be pretty jacked up to be even thinking about that in your, you know, well, and it came to a point to where, uh, like I said, so that one night I, I took what I thought would help and uh, I woke up the next morning and I was laying in the living room, the floor of the apartment I was living in. And I thought, once I realized I'm still here, I thought, you know, there is, there is no way this is my purpose in life. There's no way I've had too good a career, too good a family that uh, at that time I'm 40, not quite 50 yet, 48, 40. I said, there's no way I should be lying here in a one bedroom apartment, living room floor, you know, feeling sorry for myself and, and doing what I'm doing. So I say, uh, after 16 months separation, I called my wife and I always get emotional talking about it because if it wasn't for her answer, I would, I probably wouldn't be here, but I told her, I said, I want to come home. And she said, come on. And, uh, of course there were some stipulations, (laughs) but, uh, um, but that was the day that I knew that I knew I was going to, I didn't know I'd be as happy as I am now, but I knew I was going to make my way out of that because I thought, uh, wow, if, if God gave her the grace to forgive me, that there's not anything I can't overcome. So, that's when the road to recovery started mm-hmm. and uh, it wasn't easy. And I always tell people it's, you know, people see me now and go, Oh, I'm going, I still have bad days. I still have, you know, let me take that back. I learned, I heard a guy speak. There's no such thing as a bad day. Any day you get up, there's no such thing as a bad day. There's some tough days, but there's never a bad day. Mm-hmm. So um, anyway, I went to treatment and was diagnosed, you know, PTSD, anxiety. Uh, and uh, one of the things i I went twice because the first time, once I got home, I really was, I was going to make my family happy and make them feel good. And so that's not, that's not the reason you need to go. You need to go. I was trying to say like, I admire you. I admire everything about you, 
right so and oh, like you. not only obviously because you are a hero and that's probably just still hard to hear but honestly yeah. because because of the career and your life choices and then also mm-hmm. just for sharing your story right now and still being i think what is so important is still to be tender and vulnerable mm-hmm. in that situation and i think in that you are setting setting the standard like you know what i mean of what does it mean to be even can i say a man like i right. think and i think that you are shaping our definition in really good ways and healthy ways that you you don't have to be the previous generation of like cranky <laughs> guys who don't wear masks because <laughs> right. that's just dumb right everybody right. knows that but what does it mean to be a husband what does it mean to be a father what does it mean to be a a, a contributing member of society that is healthy that recognizes your own limitations and that recognizes that need to to bring healing Mm-hmm. So I just want to say thanks. Um, I think it's, I was just struck by the unique situation that you encountered. Not everybody's trauma is actually documented. Mm-hmm. Yours was, and not everybody's trauma is repeated, you know, so that you actually become that visual memory in, in everybody's minds. Like I remember that photo, right? And I, I'm so glad to meet you. But so I feel like you've, really taken it kind of on the chin as far as um as trauma goes and so i think that takes a lot of courage and that's one of our hero um, attributes (laughs) i don't know if you checked out our website but definitely and i think that it takes a lot of guts to to have your website and just put it out there and to acknowledge that this is something that firefighters and emergency rescue people do encounter. So like, I don't know if you have anything more to say, but I have a question. So maybe I'll just give you a chance in a sec, but like, I just like wanted to say like, what advice like would you give, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like you've been an overcomer, you overcome but like for those who are still kind of in that quiet hidden kind of pain mm-hmm. what, what what would you say to them you know it, it kind of goes back to when i talked about even being on this job you have to you can't be selfish you have to put yourself above you mm-hmm. know everybody else has to come up, not necessarily before you but you have to be concerned with everybody else not just you but and that comes to uh and i don't know we'll get to it one of the questions we talked about earlier was um I I try to tell the young people that I meet that you know you're going to experience trauma and once they recognize that it's okay to not be okay and you're every feeling and emotion they have on these on these calls are perfectly normal and my goal and some and we'll get into the things I'm doing now with some guys I work with our goal is to not to get to people and say, here's how you stop from having PTSD or anxiety. We're not going to stop that. That's not what we're doing. Our deal is to say, you don't have to wait until the wheels fall off before you do reach out. And these other guys I work with, we all four, we all waited until the wheels, you know, fell off before we reached out and got help. And things have changed so much in the first responder world and the fire service as far as peer support and people to reach out to. And I always try to tell them, it doesn't have to be anybody on the peer support. Just talk to somebody. And sometimes when you just talk about it, it doesn't mean, and I always try to tell them, I say, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, I don't want to be the poster child here and, and scare them that says, well, if you experience this, you're going to go to treatment. You know, you're going to almost lose your family. If not lose your family, you're, that's not, that's my, my point when I tell my story to say, you don't have to get to this point. So it's just about being, uh, to reaching out for that help. And I've always said that as heroic as people think our profession is and the things we do to me, it's more heroic to be that person that steps out, steps up and says, I need help because I want to keep, I want to keep being a vital part of this fire department or of this team that keeps giving back to the community. And if I can't, don't take care of myself, I'm going to lose that opportunity. And I can't think where I, if I would end up getting fired from the fire department, there is no, I wouldn't be doing this interview for number one. Uh, I might, you know, be an, I don't know. I really don't, I can't even fathom where I would be. So it's just about, like I say, just um, uh, 
you know, just reaching out and, and, and just talking about it. And like I say, sometimes that's all some people need, you know, I waited until just talking about it wasn't, wasn't enough, but, um, so, but that has a lot. And, and, and real quick, when you talked about the, you know, the, uh, the, the trauma of the, of the photo and just having to relive it all the time. And, but, you know, I've, I've, now I'm in a good place with it. You know, I, I had a guy tell me, you know, years ago, that's just, that's just, it's part of my story. It's not who I am. Uh, I'm not just the fire, you know, I did 32, almost 32 years in the fire department. I'm not just the firefighter in the photo. There's been so much other stuff go on. And when I did reach out and went and got help and came back to Oklahoma City, I went to a place out in California, came back to Oklahoma, followed up with a clinician here named Kathy Thomas, who is my superhero. She uh, introduced me to a treatment called EMDR and EMDR saved my life. And what I found that when I was thinking, okay, if I can just get past this bombing issue and the things I've done to my family and all that, I'm good. But when I went into treatment and came out and started following up, talking to Kathy, I found out that the, the bombing in the photo was just the, that's kind of what tilted the, the scales. It was so much more other of uh, accumulative trauma, you know, uh, in 31 years on the job, you know, I've lost uh, three, four, four, six, six brothers in the line of duty you know, uh, made calls on, you know, made a car wreck where one of my fire department buddies, him and his 12 year old son were killed and we were on duty and made that car wreck. So, I mean, there was just so many uh, childhood trauma. There was just so many other little things. And here I was just, you know, caught up on this, this bombing. And, it, and once I was able to get with Kathy and we got down that road and I was able to deal with all of that. And, and as firefighters, we don't, we, we, we don't talk about it. We deal with it our own little way. I mean, when we lost our three firefighters in 89, we go to the funerals, we hug, we cry, but we don't talk about that feeling. All we do is start telling what we call war stories or good humor stories about them. And that's just, and then we just, we go back to work. And that is not, that is not how you process, you know, and, and get it. And I've learned that it took a lot because you know and like i say now it's it's a horrible word to use because it should always be acceptable but now it's more acceptable to reach out and, and get help like you know? i feel like you're uh changing the culture you know what i mean it's like a it's a wholesale shift it it, it is there's a, there's a big change in culture and uh like i say and some of the things I, I'm, I'm doing now to help just a minute there's there's great people everywhere but uh I'm blessed and honored. I get the opportunity to do podcasts like these where I get to get my story out there. I've been invited to speak at some conferences, but the most rewarding thing I get to do now is uh, me and three other gentlemen have a, uh, it's a weekly, not podcast, Zoom thing we do called Trauma Behind the Badge. And uh, I'm the only firefighter. The other three are all retired cops, but they all, uh, all have a story to tell. We all waited till the wheels fell off, but we have this weekly show and we have different people on that have been through what we've been through and they tell their story. Last night you talked, uh, we had a, we did our show and it was just us talking, but all we talked about the title of our show was a positive side of trauma. And a lot of people are like, what's positive about trauma? Well, it's that growth, you know, it's a post-traumatic PTSG, TG, post-traumatic stress growth. And uh, that is, the growth and the positive side of it is would we want to wish it on anybody? No. Do we hate that we live? Th yeah, but we're glad we lived through it. And this is the positive side of it. Um, you know, two of the gentlemen on the show actually put guns to their head and pulled the trigger and they're still here to talk about it. You know, uh, Raul Rivas, one of the other ones, he was the one that was involved in the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando. He actually took down the shooter, you know, at the Pulse nightclub. And so, and it's just, and, and, you know, we all still have these rough days and what we call triggers, little things will just trigger us. For me, it's the smell of wet concrete dust because it rained the night of the bombing. And so we run that, you know, and for Raul, a lot of things are, he said, one of the images that stands out most to him is when they were walking through there after everything was, all these cell phones were going off and lighting up everywhere, family trying to contact their loved ones to see if they were there, see if they're alive. He said, it's just, everywhere so things like that are triggers for him but we've learned to accept them deal with them 
in better ways than we than we used to. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm at now. Like I said, it, it's just about the uh, the growth afterwards. And um, you know, Chris, like I've uh, been taking notes um, on what you've uh -oh. been saying. No, it's it's amazing. <laughs> okay. I actually should post these notes, but. Um, can, can I just like, I just want to point out a few very important messages here yeah. that I, that you're, you're sharing with us. One, I think this is the idea of rejecting pride um, mm -hmm. and, and being, allowing yourself to be humble enough to ask for help when you need it. Um, and I think that's important because a lot of us were like, Hey, we're, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you just kind of buck up and you keep going and then at some point it'll get better. Like mysteriously, it'll get better. Right. So I think it's just understanding that like we were, you know, all of us here, we're like a global family, right? Like we're put here to be in community with other people. And so we're never meant to do this alone. And so right. it's just this whole idea of just rejecting outright any kind of pride saying I can do this alone. The second thing is this idea that you know, like you hit rock bottom, right? Like that's what I would call your moment was it was like mm -hmm. rock bottom before you called your wife and you're like, I really want to come home. Um, but like that wasn't the end of your story. And so I think this whole idea, like it's never too late. It's never too late right. to turn your life around and to ask for help. And so I want to make sure like people like hear that clearly if somebody feels like they're in a place where like they've just done too many things, they've broken too many bridges, they're too broken. Like it's just not too late for that. Um, and, and then the third thing it reminds me, and I, I think I might've shared this on the podcast, but Chris, you haven't heard it. So I'm going to tell you, um, and it's this whole idea of the power of love that you're talking about, right? Where like your wife, your family were very much compelling you um, to, to seek healing. And then even, those you served with and those that were coming up behind you, like they were compelling you to, to, to seek the healing that you, you needed to get. And, and my dad, like he, he told me some time ago, he said, Chris, I love this. I'm going to share with you. He said three things. He said, everybody needs three things. They need one, they need something to do Two, They need someone to love and three, they need something to hope for. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what you're saying is like that second part where, when we are able to have something external to us that we fix our eyes on, right. um, we are able to keep going even when we, and humble ourselves and say, wow, I've, I've done something's wrong. I need help. Right. Um, so well, I think, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say you hit on that, that hope, um, something to hope for last night during our deal on the chat deal, somebody put in a question about, you know, well, how do you incur, how do you get somebody to treatment that says they know they need treatment, but they won't go. And Chris Scallon, one of the guys uh, on the deal with us, he's, he's phenomenal, but he said, he, and he read a deal and a Dr. Solomon did a deal years ago and it's, y'all have to look it up. Don't ask me to expand on it because I don't know, but it's called the, but it's called the, the, the pie deal, P I E and P stands for something I and E, but it got to the deal about hope. And he said, that is, he said, how do you get somebody? All we do is we get to, we give people hope. I can't make, I can't make Ann go to treatment mm -hmm. if she doesn't want to go. She has to want to go. But what I can offer her is hope because mm -hmm. I can say, this is where I was and look where I am now. Yep. So we don't go out to, you know, when we go we, and we get to travel, the trauma behind the badge, we're getting ready to be in Daytona. We get to do some stuff, tell our stories. We help peer support groups form and uh, at different departments but that's what we offer is it's a, it's, it's, it's just hope. Yeah. It's not a miracle drug. It's not a miracle cure. It's just, we offer, we offer hope. And, yeah. and that's one of the, uh, you talked about um, pride and all that. Uh, I listened to a gentleman speak and I'm terrible at remembering who says things, but uh, uh, he talked about, you know, when I got to that point in my life, I had two choices. I could go this road of pride and ego, or I could go this road of love. I went pride and ego. And I saw what that got me, you know, and he talked about the love. He said, and I always leave out love for myself. I always struggle with that and still forgiving myself. I still have some tough days, but he talked about, you know, he listed, you know, what I listed and he put love for yourself, but he said, love for yourself, love for your family, love for your job. That's the road you need to, to go down. And I chose pride and ego and forgot all that. And that's where it got me. Yeah. So you mentioned, so it was just, you know, you mentioned two things that, 
were on my mind talking about hope and then like say the pride and the ego part so yeah good so is is the trauma behind the badge is that for um primarily first responders or is it open to anybody oh no no it's open to anybody we tell you know we have a uh www.traumabehindthebadge.com and you go there and you can register for our our weekly we call them webinars but not really zoom like meetings teaching webinar, or yeah. but it's a zoom deal whatever you want to call it but it's a weekly deal and you register and you get emails with the link to go to it and we always uh, you know a couple of weeks ago we focused on nurses you know because they're often they're the left out part of first responders yeah. dispatchers and nurses yeah. are always left out of first responders especially during the pandemic which is another thing that angers me that now we're recognizing these nurses they've done this every day of their life since they've had their careers not just because there's a pandemic going on but it took a pandemic to get them recognized which i'm glad they're getting recognized but uh our our show is it's very very different some people may click on and click off because it is like uh for us it's like sitting around the table at the fire station or the cops sitting out back before they head out on patrol it's uh it's brutal honestly honesty from all of us and the people we have on so it's not always the most child-friendly show to watch i mean because sometimes they're just you know language used that that's just how it that's just how it is and uh but we always have uh and and it's really cool we've we've vetted we and have great friends with some clinicians around the united states and they're either they're either part of the panel or they're part of the attendees that way if anybody ever reaches out during the during the show which we have had happen we we have a clinician right there it's not just a bunch of retired yahoos you know yeah. uh talking to them so Good. it's uh it's for everybody and Good. uh like i say okay. it's been one of the it's one it's the highlight for me right now yeah well we'll make sure to link to that in our show notes and um and chris it was it's an honor to have you on the podcast and i i'm just amazed by you and keep going like keeping uh-huh. that mentor and that voice of hope and you know, and we just want to encourage all of you guys like grieve. If you need to grieve, grieve well, cry, talk to other people, and then believe that on the other side, there's going to be hope that you can't. And and then that's one of the things when you say that grieve and grieve, uh, that's one of the things I've learned through everything that I know I'm still going to, I have many, many, many great days, but every now and then I have a tough day. Just one of them, you know, your body just gets in a funk sometimes and I have, but I don't, I don't resist it anymore. I don't try to fight it. I just let it happen. If that means I got to sit here in my little office and sob, cry for a couple hours and read stuff. That's what I do. You know, if I tell my wife, Hey, yeah, we can go shopping later, but I just need about three hours to, you know, get myself together. And so I don't, instead of going to any other vices that I used to go to, I've learned just to accept it instead of trying to use one of my vices to put it out of my mind. I just, I just let it happen and know that, I know what's going to be on the other side of it. So good. You said good. that perfectly. Spoken from somebody who has experienced <laughs> <laughs> a right. lot. So yeah. thanks, Chris. And thank you guys for joining us for another episode of the Hero Makers Podcast. Go back and listen to Jim McDonough, episode 27. Um, and, you know, I also think you guys go back and listen to the episode we had with uh, Jay Schiffman, right? And I mean, he, he was talking about dealing with some mental illness and um, some good, good ways to get treatment. And so, Um, We're thankful for you guys, and we'll see you guys next time.